What's up everyone? Welcome back to Mix Masala with TG and this is the final part of the session with Waswo X Waswo. In this episode, the artist will focus more on the subjects that his artwork contains and how these visuals change with time from his practice or uh, photograph and how it leads to miniature paintings and so on if you are listening to this episode for the first time i would request the listener to have a listen to the first part and the second part of conversation with Vasco X Vasco also in order to have a better understanding and get an idea of what we are going to talk i hope this has been a great um episode for all my listeners i really want to thank Vasco X Vasco for giving his time in midst of his busy schedule and especially when it was done all out of nothing you know like we had no plans i had no clue that i was going to meet up with was wo and everything just happened so really want to thank uh was wo and really appreciate now we are getting know, into your uh, work listeners and into, uh, into this session yeah. and about my observation uh my observations are like you know you i think you depict yourself in the miniature paintings also yes it's you right well it started being me and i told rakesh in those days i said paint me in the miniature i said to make sure people understand as a foreigner paint me in like a a light suit so with a white hat cuz i always would wear the white hat uh huh and he added the red tie on his own Okay. And he also added the water bottle. The water bottle is Rakesh's invention, not mine. Okay. So okay. that's become like a real symbol for me now as the water bottle is always <laughs> in my hand or near me. That was our VJ, that wasn't me, decided right. to put in the water bottle. And so he adds his own little touches, and but I think eventually as time went on it became more of an every man and sort of like an every man, not even every foreigner, it could even be an Indian man. Some people say that figure could actually be an Indian to mm-hmm. but he's mm-hmm. sort of the clueless outsider be her he a foreigner or an urbanite it who gives is having a hard time like understanding and fitting in yeah. with the locals i think the, the desi culture. visually also the so, you know a man wearing a suit itself is in contrast with the entire composition you know it gives it highlights that figure and then you know you, uh, the viewer tends to like Im- in the very early miniatures he always wore shoes too mm-hmm, but now mm-hmm. he always has bare feet mm-hmm. which i think sort of symbolizes that he's become partially adapted to the where place he is he's a little more grounded with his feet on the mm-hmm, ground mm-hmm. and uh and and with your works also i think this is again very interesting for me like uh there are certain uh, compositions where uh you have like the actual miniature composition sort of thing but then you also tend to go beyond that also you know it's like you're inside a landscape and you're way over outside space in the space you know you're looking from because you have like the globe and all these structures Sometimes also coming I'm in from in a balloon a hot air balloon huh, huh. looking down on the landscape there's there's a lot of things i want to say number 1 Um you know when I do the photography like I did that whole series on Gauri dancers mm-hmm. which is a local tribal dance that's done here um at the end of the monsoon and uh, it's only in the district of Miwar mm-hmm. a little bit in northern Gujarat and um and Madhya Pradesh you know if I remember right it starts the day after Rakhi or something like that but you know there was a lot of discussing about the names because if you listen to like academics in Delhi Okay. They'll say it's not Gauri, it's Gavari. It's the yeah, Gavari. Yeah, they say something like Gavari. But nobody locally says that. Okay. They will either say Gavri or Gauri, and the most common pronunciation is Gauri. 
So I decided to go with what the villagers themselves mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. The villagers themselves generally say Gauri dance, Gauri, Gauri. You know, it's more of an academics that say Gavari. So with Udaipur, was it like the art and culture heritage that was there that actually got you attracted? Yeah, there were a lot of things. There were, it was the artisans, obviously the beauty of the city. Um, the fact that I made friends here quite easily and very early on I developed friends in Udaipur. Um, yeah, the cultural of Miwar I find fascinating. Um, they're so smart. I mean, all these lakes, you know, mm -hmm. are man-made. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They're all man-made lakes. I mean, over hundreds of years, they built an incredible system of catch basins out in the mountains that then channel through dug canals uh -huh. into all of these lakes and feed the lakes. I mean, it's a wonderful water retention system. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed by that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they started work on this before they had, you know, steam shovels and yeah. things like that. It was dug by hand. Yeah. I mean, if you can imagine that. So I have incredible respect for the culture and the history here. And, um, but anyway, what I was saying is like, so the Gauri dancers are pretty straightforward portraits and there's probably more of an emphasis on the costuming than anything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, if you look at those Gauri dancer photos or from the book previously, which is called Photo Walla, um, you look at the backdrops. The backdrops have very strong miniature elements in them. The trees are painted like miniatures. The forts are painted like miniatures mm -hmm. because the person who was painting my backdrops was Dalpat Singh. And Dalpat okay. Singh is a miniaturist. Uh -huh. So those photographs, I like to say that those photographs could be the photographs that the man in the miniatures is taking. Because mm -hmm. he's often taking photographs in the mm -hmm. miniatures. And you could imagine the photo series as be the photos that he's making. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> it's all kind of a n other world because I think one thing that fascinates me about here is just this whole mythology. Um, there's sort of, you know, the Rajasthan and the Miwar as it is, mm -hmm. and then there's the mythology that swirls around this through the art of miniature painting, mm -hmm. you know, which is a much more magical world than yeah. the reality, pro yeah. probably. But I like that magic. So anyway, yeah, we've done different uh, series in the miniature paintings, and um, one I really like, we did one in 2014, which was called Chaos in the Palace. Okay. And this was around the time where I was becoming quite upset politically. And I'd always been very much of a liberal leftist type of guy. And in 2014, I started swinging more towards the right and becoming more conservative because I thought <laughs> that the left had just gone really crazy. You know, and they, and they really went crazy once Trump was elected. You know, they just went totally bonkers as far as I'm concerned. Um, not that the right doesn't have problems, they mm -hmm. certainly do, but I think the left has its own problems now. And I felt everything was descending into chaos, so we did this series of, I think it was 16 miniature paintings, and that's when I first approached Dalpat Jingar, and I said to Dalpat, I said, I want you to paint some miniature paintings, because you know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And I found an old Persian, actually, palace. I forget what it was now, Some something. A photograph? Probably. No, it was a, it was a miniature painting done by okay. a Persian okay. artist. Um, I think it was Saadi's, Saadi's, Saadi's Garden or something like that, I forget now. But um, I said, I want you to paint this, but I want you to eliminate all the figures, just use the palace background. I want you to paint it 16, 18 times, I think it was, 18 times. And I want everyone to be the same, mm -hmm. but everyone is different with colors. So no okay. two will match with colors. Okay. The colors should be bright, almost like an Andy Warhol brightness. Uh -huh. And they should all be like different colors, so no two are identical. And he did that, and he did a wonderful job. Then those went to our VJ, and we started inserting figures in them. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Chaos in the Palace, you can see books being burned, which was, you know, obviously a reference to censorship. Um, you can see M.F. Hussein painting in flames. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, you can see characters that look like the Shiv Sena with their bows and arrows, which is the, the symbol for the Shiv Sena. Um, you can see a... Um, so these this. symbols, a lot icons... Of, a lot of symbols. There was a lot of politics in there. Okay. And the king is depicted as being on this very ridiculously high throne, <laughs> but he's a little midget of a king who has no power, mm -hmm. which is sort of like the emasculization that has gone on through society. And I'm up on this big structure taking his portrait mm. in that particular thing. And actually in one of the miniatures, we did a homage to Magritte, and we had Magritte's apple in a room, which oh, to me was very similar okay. to our <laughs> figures oh. in these rooms. So we did Magritte's apple in a room, but we did the Carcana. So there's a bunch of Indian artists sitting on the floor and they're painting Magritte's apple again and again and again. And there's like 20 <laughs> Magritte apples in there with production line. You know? And uh, so there was a lot of societal... Um, um, criticism or commentary in that. Um, there's in one of the what? miniatures, there's this giant peacock with this beautiful tail that fills up almost the entire room. And then in another one, you have the queen looking very vainly into a mirror and she's wearing a dress that's made out of peacock feathers. So oh. she's obviously killed the peacock yeah. to make a yeah. dress, yeah. you know, like this, the, the materialism, the abuse of the natural world, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all little elements of what I felt was going on in society that was um, related, a lot related to censorship, a lot related to just a breakdown of society. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became a hit at the India Art Fair. It sold for too little money. My gallerist now says I, that she should have charged twice as much for that. Okay. You know? But anyway, it sold very quickly. And, um, and that was when? 2014. 2014. We worked. On, I think. I think we worked on it in 2014. I think it was exhibited at the India Art Fair in 2015, if I remember mm -hmm, the dates mm -hmm. right. And then we did another series that's one of my favorites. Um, I wanted to sell it as a set, but the galleries couldn't sell it as a set. I was very disappointed, so it got broken up to some extent because some collectors bought five pieces and some bought uh -huh. six. But it was plates from 31 plates from George Franklin Atkinson's Curry and Rice, which okay. was a book that this British man did. And it was so similar to our own work. It was like a satire on the Brits in India. He had done okay. these etchings, these okay. drawings that were printed as etchings, um, or actually I think they were lithographs lithographic plates, but they depicted the British in India at this hill station called Kebab, the hill station of Kebab. Okay. And it basically makes fun of the British, uh -huh. you know, the British just being pompous and arrogant and fat, you know, and sadly, sometimes he made fun of the Indians too in that, you know, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't totally politically correct for sure. But I like the idea of what he was doing. So we took those actual little lithographs mm -hmm. and we painted my figure into them. I think so yeah, a lot of your compositions tend to give out this idea of humor. Yeah, know, they, it was a funny series. So, you know, like the British are all at a table and they're all like drinking wine and they're all surrounded by Indian servants all attending mm -hmm. to them. But I'm laying on the floor drinking directly out of a bottle and I'm sitting with the Indians. I'm not sitting with the foreigners, uh -huh. you know, things like that. <coughs> We're in it. And uh, that became quite a hit. That's one of my favorite series, actually. I was sad that it was broken up when it got so sold. Why, it should why, have stayed together, I think. Why did you uh, want to depict a character like because I saw in George Franklin Atkinson, I saw myself, I thought he was doing something very similar to what I'm doing mm -hmm. with the miniature paintings mm -hmm. in a different way. A little less politically correct than I am. I mean, I'm thought to be politically correct, but some of his images, I would say, were just racist in the mm -hmm. way they were depicted. Mm -hmm. But he was also poking fun at the British. So a little both ways with him. And I wanted to respond to it in some way. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So... That happened. And like when you had this uh, 
like now in Delhi and everywhere you are doing exhibition even uh, you are going abroad right now to do another exhibition in Dubai or something no actually no we, yeah we do the fairs so we've done Art Hong Kong mm -hmm. and we've done Art Singapore and we've done Art Dubai and every year we do Art Abu Dhabi so how, how has so been the that's why we're so like, busy because uh -huh. we have a lot of work to make I mean, right now I'm supposed to be making new photographs actually All right. to get painted up for Art Singapore and I haven't made a one. So I've got to get busy and get out to the studio and start working. I've been busy with our print sale the past week, which tends to happen every year around Diwali. I do prints of the miniature paintings okay. and then we, we put gold borders, real gold leaf around the edges. Mm -hmm. And that print sale has done very well for the past two years, so I wanted to do that again because we tend to sort of sell out on that. And, uh, so the originals are all done by hand, and yes, then you and then they're digital prints. Digital prints. But then we put gold leaf around. Then we we tear the edges so they have a nice rough edge. All right. And then we gold leaf them like okay. that. Okay. Okay. And then I have a series called Dreams of the Orientalist, which currently there's like 30 pieces in that series. They get sold as they're made. They don't have to stay together. They can stand as individual works. Mm -hmm. But um, And every time when you work mm -hmm. on a new series, you mm -hmm. know, when, like, like you have sets of works, right, being made. Yeah. So every time when you're, okay, how do you decide, like, okay, this set is actually done? And now we are going to start with a new set, you know. Well, the, the Atkinson one, I knew, I selected the images of his that I liked and I wanted to respond mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And so, one, I'm not even in it. Okay. One, Atkinson had done a uh, print of just this very poor farmer, you know, with his bones showing almost, tending the bullock, pulling a plow. Mm -hmm. And then there was just something, some buildings on the side. And to me that was very sad. And he had titled it, Our Agriculturalist, which I thought he was making fun of this mm -hmm. man. It's like, why are you making fun of this poor man? You know, I thought it was very arrogant, honestly. And so all we added to that was a couple white balloons in the sky. And then in the corner, there's the water bottle sitting, okay. you know, to give a little hint like I was yeah. there. And the reason I did the balloons, I want to give a feeling like the British are having a party somewhere. Uh. And this man's out struggling to produce the food for the British. So I wanted to give it some context, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Because I thought in that particular print, I thought Atkinson was being very racist, especially with the title he gave it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But then in other prints, he's obviously making fun of the British. I mean, he depicts the British as these big fat people with their feet up in these lounge chairs, you know, the old yeah, British lounge yeah. chairs that have those boards that swing out that hold their legs and just kind of waiting to be served their wine, you know, and whatever. And he's obviously making fun of them because yeah. he doesn't depict them in a flattering manner at all. He depicts them as big bloated cows, you know. <laughs> so he he... He could like see the problems, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you look at the artworks that has been created, uh, you don't see a lot of this deconstructing of the entire miniature field. You know, you always right. try to uh, do something within the parameters of you know what actual uh, miniature paintings uh, like are done or are made. You know, so you add like I think that is very interesting. You know, how you find space to also put these small, small elements, but still blends in with the actual miniature. Yeah, and you know, we, we did a lot of homages, and this yeah. was part of our education, and sometimes I give things to Rakesh to do just because, you know, he came from a very vernacular place, and mm -hmm. this is, there's a book called The Artful Life of R. V. J which doesn't have my name on the cover, it has our DJs and Anna Perna Garamella wrote that and it's all about Rakesh. Okay. And it's, he, she said she wanted to do this book but she didn't want to write it about how an, an American worked with an Indian artist. She wanted to write it from the standpoint how an Indian vernacular artist worked with an American. So she takes Rakesh's point of point view in all of this. All it's right. a very good book, mm -hmm. if I say so myself. And um, I got sidetracked by talking about the book I forgot what I was going to say oh, like the elements you know how you managed to fit inside within the you know the actual vi uh, visual representation of miniature paintings oh 
Okay, so in that book, I brought up that book because in that book there's a lot of homages to um, Indian artists. So we went through a series early on, going way back to 2007, mm -hmm. where we started doing homages to Atul Dodia, Anju Dodia, mm -hmm. um, Rabin Mondal, um, Lalu Prasad Shah, um, trying to think of some of the others that we made homages to. Uh, a. Ramachandran, mm -hmm. who often comes to Udaipur, by the way, to paint. Okay, a. He Ramachandran does. comes here quite often. Um, but anyway, we, we basically adopted their styles and turned it into a miniature painting styles of some sort and inserted myself All right. in some way. And I thought that was a really nice series. And Rakesh remembers it because it helped him learn about Indian contemporary art. Okay. So through doing those paintings, he started to understand Anju Dodia. He loves Anju Dodia now. All right. You know, he's in, he reveres her, you know. And so do I, actually. I think Anju Dodia is incredible. Um, Atul Dodia is incredibly friendly and nice. I like Atul a lot. Um, so it's... Uh, well, sometimes we it can be very hard to you know, depict something because now in the contemporary period there's so many ways to like uh, include visuals or imagery in your artwork, you know, there's so many ways, collages and uh, different different techniques you can use to create, you know, a lot of mixed media. I, uh, I shy away from mixed media. I don't like things that are pasted together. Mm -hmm. um, that generally seems sort of a cheating way to I remember the first time um, when I saw your work, uh, I thought it looks very photographic, but maybe they he has cut, the artist has cut out no, the no, image and that. you know, like I was just we thinking... We never do that, but we collage in the sense that we will take things from other people and insert it in our work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in that homage, when we did the homage to Rabin Mondal, Rabin Mondal had a wonderful image that was almost like Van Gogh's bedroom at Arles, I think it was. But um, it, Rabin just painted this lonely bed in this room in his style with those really sickly blues and sickly greens and a red and black checkered floor and a window or a door, I think it was. And we painted the same thing basically, but we inserted me uh -huh. inside and there's a lizard there's like a chipkali on the bed a lizard and I'm going uh -huh, holding my uh -huh, hat uh -huh, up high uh -huh. and screaming yeah, yeah, you yeah. know because I see the lizard in the bed so it's kind of a one-liner joke in way <laughs> you know admittedly but it came out very beautifully I really like that miniature it, it's beautiful mm -hmm. it's just a little bit of humor and it's a homage to Rabbi Mondal I wanted to work I mean, he's He's slighted in the art world. He's not given much credit these days. His prices yeah. have never gone up the way they should have. So, I mean, Anish, Ashish Ann in a Delhi Art Gallery has tried to push Rabin Mondal ever since I've been in India for the past 20 years, and he doesn't seem to have much luck because the prices just don't seem to rise much. You know, not like prices like other mm -hmm. artists have. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I wanted to give a little nod. And then another thing, like, after we went to Bundi, we came back and I s told Rakesh, I said, I, I want you to paint Bundi trees, because he hadn't been painting Bundi trees. Okay. And so I said, we're going to do a miniature. There's going to be three segments. I'm going to be sleeping in each one. And each one you could do a very special Bundi tree, and I told him what trees I wanted him to paint. Mm -hmm. And then you make the background how you want, but make some beautiful background, you know, with some elephants mm -hmm. in the back or something. Oh, he painted such a beautiful painting. And it was really meant to be more of an exercise, just, just for him to practice <laughs> painting trees. But he made one of the best paintings ever, and still to this day it's one of our most popular paintings. Okay. And we called it Three Nights in Bundi. All right. You know. So it was a little document of our three nights in Bundi when we went and studied the miniatures. Oh. So yeah, there's a story behind everything we do, basically. Mm -hmm. Collaborations happening, you know, with every piece. I think that sort of uh, aspect really got my attention. Managing and coming together and then producing an artwork, the final representation, it's very challenging. And 
for me one when you look at your artwork you can see a lot of different angles that you are looking through you know it's not usually like ah uh, number one also because uh, miniature painting also has its own isometric sort of uh, view point you know but then because maybe the influence of photography you have very interesting perspective it's not like there are some artists if you look at amrita shergill's painting uh, sometimes you will feel you know that she comes from a higher class you know her painting is always from to, uh, top view right. looking down you know on the subjects right right you know and uh, yes she is depicting the lifestyle of the common people but there's the way of looking you know how she is perceiving that world uh, it's very different but when it comes to your paintings your work i think it's it's like you know there's this equality maintained it's not like i no like way. working class people because mm -hmm. i'm a working class boy mm -hmm. at heart still and like yeah i got some money now but at heart i'm still that working class boy from a lot mm -hmm. you know and um it drives my gallerists a little crazy i mean i told bhavna cocker one time i said <laughs> you know bhavna you know i can do it i can put on the suit and tie and i can look like Yeah, the funky artist. I always keep my hat on, you know, who comes in <laughs> and socialize with the socialites and go out to dinner with them and blah blah blah. But the truth is, it's a little difficult for me because that's not my milieu. If mm -hmm. I'm saying that mm -hmm. right, it's not really where I fit in. Mm -hmm. You know, I fit in at the chai shop here. Yeah. You understand? <laughs> I fit in with my crowd of artists. That's where I feel comfortable. Yeah. And uh, I always feel like I have to put on a little act, and there's a superficiality that creeps in when you're with that crowd. They're not being superficial; they're being themselves, maybe because that's their circle. Mm -hmm. But for me, I feel I become a little superficial when I'm there because I don't really feel I fit into it. And I'm not saying I don't have friends in that crowd, but because I do. We have a series called the Blue Series which Rakesh has painted and it the blue series is called the blue series because they're blue and it's basically sky and water almost all of them and there's generally an island and I'm on the island in one way or another and a lot of it deals with isolation or loneliness mm -hmm. or feeling are the landscapes landscapes that are there in your painting because there's a lot of uh, different uh, structures coming in you know you have indoor views also Uh, in your paint, in your yeah, work, yeah, we try to do that. And oh. you have outside view, the modern uh, structures coming up. In terms of landscape, do you go out and take uh, photographs of vicinity, and then in? I that don't. I know we're not taking photographs like consciously. I obviously take clips with my mobile phone and things mm -hmm. for reference sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I've had to train myself to observe a little more in my conceptualization. Okay. And I encourage Rakesh to also observe a little more, and we teach each other things. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I'll give you an example. When we first started, Rakesh would paint mountains, and on top of the mountains there were little trees marching like soldiers mm -hmm. on top of the mountain. And I would say that is totally unnatural. That doesn't look right. You know, the trees should be more up and down. Make them different looking trees. All these little. Trees like soldiers just doesn't look good. <laughs> Then I was out with Ganpat one day, and Ganpat pointed and said, "Look, Chacha, Rakesh trees." And I looked, and there were mountains, and there were trees marching like little soldiers on top of the mountains. And uh -huh. I realized this is the real Miwari landscape, especially mm -hmm. in the hot season when all this growth dies, and you only have certain hardy trees that are growing mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that Rakesh actually knows more what he's talking about than I do. But then I also go back to him sometimes and say, "Well, all your trees are looking the same, and look at this miniature painting, historical, and look at how beautiful this tree is. Why don't you give me a tree like this?" <laughs> you know. So we have this back and forth, uh -huh, you know. Uh -huh. And sometimes I have to acquiesce to Rakesh's desire because the way he paints miniature paint. Trees in, on the tops of the mountains. I now realize that's very traditional in Rajasthani miniature painting, mm -hmm. also to paint trees like that. Mm -hmm. So he's following a tradition. Mm -hmm. He's not just a bad artist, which is the way I would interpret it at first. Like you're not, you're not playing with it enough. Uh -huh. You know, you're uh -huh. not being creative enough. Is what would go through my mind. So we both learn things as we go, and I mean that's the way collaboration has to work.
mm-hmm. you know and i think uh, as time progressed the subject of you like uh, the image of you starts to also give a different uh, meaning to why you are there i think in the beginning your existence in that visual was very different to now what the meaning is right i mean it's like i lost the shoes oh. and sometimes we paint ourselves in situations we did one called jolly which we actually framed in a wooden jolly okay and it was meant to sit on a pedestal and you could walk around it so one side had like the men's side of the courtyard and it was relating to my studio in Varda actually. Okay. One side was the men's side and it showed all the men playing cards and drinking and smoking chillums and blah 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 <laughs> and I'm laying there on a charpoy and I'm just kind of drinking from a bottle with all the men, uh-huh. you know. And then as you walked around to the other side, you have nothing but women and the women are all busy washing, cooking, gathering the mm-hmm. firewood, blah blah blah, which is what I've often observed in the village mm-hmm. that you know, but now obviously the men go out and work in the fields too. But, you know, that that dichotomy between the men at play and the women yeah. still working, okay. you know, and that's what that was about. So things come about from observation and then it gets expressed some way in and I I tried to do it in a creative way and I made a painting with two sides that you literally have to walk around mm-hmm. with and the jolly references is to the jolly that divides yeah. the compound compound you know and how has the responses uh, been like maybe at your uh, hometown in the US when you they know, forgotten the work? about me except for a few i mean they don't remember me how much at all i had a few good artist friends back there we keep a little bit in contact on facebook but mm-hmm. um you know there's a few there's this character called Jimmy Van Milwaukee it's not a real name okay Jimmy Van Milwaukee he was kind of a crazy man artist and he actually owned a gallery for a while all right and um so i mean he keeps in contact on facebook and then i had two wonderful friends who i really love Johnny Shimon and Julie Lindemann who were antiquarian photographers so they did the old gum bichromate mm-hmm. photographs mm-hmm. and you know the um, cyanotypes yeah the album and prints yana types all of that and their whole thing was being local they documented okay. they had lived in the east village in new york for a while and they moved back to wisconsin and they said we're going to be east villagers but we're living in the dairy <laughs> state here so they did these funky photos of like um midwestern girls dressed in their prom dress and their uh-huh. necklaces all dressed up for the prom but they would pose them holding their guernsey cow or something like that okay. out in the field okay. and very nice and they were beautiful photographs julie unfortunately died of cancer recently johnny is still going so but would you would I you love those would two, you say you that you are they uh, they were like role models for me okay. at one time they were role models johnny and julie shimmin and lindemann And they ran a gallery for a while too. They called their gallery the Neo Post Now Gallery, which I really like that name. Okay. The Neo Post Now Gallery. <laughs> so would you would you say that your works are political? They can be. They're not always political. I have to be careful as a foreigner. I can't be too political here. I don't want to get kicked out mm-hmm. of the country, you know. So I have to watch what I say and um and what i do and you know I have to watch what goes into the paintings but i think that but that must also help you to be be more creative about you know expressing i i i'm not so much political in the sense that this party is better than that party i'm more political in the sense of the society structure culture society culture. structures and what mm-hmm. and actually the same way i approach politics in the us to okay you know i i'm involved in the culture war and i find it fascinating i find both sides have some right and wrong in mm-hmm, that culture mm-hmm. war but they're not even talking to each other because no right like now, e- even so. even with this current government you know talking about certain subjects if anything is it's taboo like, yeah it's and it's quite the opposite because like here you can't talk about well in both places you can't talk about the power structure as it is mm. it just so happens that the power structure in india is right wing the power structure in america is left wing right now mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. in both places those on the other side are afraid to speak afraid to speak yeah. afraid to speak. and I, i and i believe free speech is integral to any society because if you can't talk somebody might feel they're totally right about a subject 
But if you're not allowed to criticize them, you never challenge them and make them maybe rethink and maybe think, well, maybe I'm not so right as I thought I was. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm in discussions with people all the time, my friends, mm-hmm. and I'll be really adamant about something I believe in. And by the time of the discussion, I have to give way a little bit and say, no, I'm not totally right. You're right about that. Yeah. You're right about that. Mm-hmm. You know? Then that's the way it should work. That's how we come together mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as people. Because so, for you, it must be challenging because you know even if you have been staying in in india for now long time you know still when you go out people the native people will always have this thing in the mind you know like we are the original people here right you know right. you you are staying here but we are like deep rooted with right, the culture right, right, and everything you know so sometimes you must be facing all these sort of well i am an outsider i am, I am an outsider and that's what i have to be okay i don't speak the language i don't speak any indian language right away that makes me an outsider now i can argue that english is an official language of india <laughs> but that's a rather shallow argument actually you know <laughs> honestly i understand some things about the culture because i've been here for 22 mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. basically but i don't understand the culture in totality you know there's a lot of there's so many things i don't know mm. i learn things every day that i didn't know before even you know even for so me also i'm asking this question because right. yeah i am indian but i was born and brought up in a german family and uh, the culture at my home is very different no. <laughs> <laughs> but so. it was like it, it was only after i left my home i was in uh, high school in i was around 15 16 i left my home Uh-huh. and started doing things by myself and i started interacting with actual indian students then and before that i was always with uh, more of western influence he had a lot of uh, foreign friends coming at our place and you know things like that so when i started realizing oh my god in india there's caste system right. i go outside uh, i go to mumbai for my college i was there for one year they were like you have to make an id card for the college I was like okay I give my documents and things like that and then when the ID card comes in they write Tenzin P Gopal Oh so I was like where does where is this P coming from what's the P P then they're like oh that's your father's name oh. and then I was like I don't want I don't want a P in my name you know you look at all my other documents It's there's no there, P there right. so why are you putting it and then the administration got really heated and he was like no you have to put this is the way you have to include your father's name mother's name i was like no see i have come here to uh, study just write the name as it is in my birth certificate and all the other you know then that's when it struck me that wow you know how all this caste and where you're coming from the surname has this sort of weightage and i ha- we never knew like at my home we are just like ha tenzin gopal we were very multicultural we never uh, emphasized on like oh this is a muslim this is no in our home we were practicing everything to me people are people and like i'm an indian but there was a lot of things that i did not know it i only realized when i came out of my home and then started interacting with the locals and then you started i i learned home. and like um When I rented this apartment, my landlord's quite nice, but I didn't know that when I rented. And I I was very straightforward. I said, "Look, I have friends here who are Hindu, Muslim, Christian, atheist, gay." I said, "If it's a problem with these people coming to my house, then I don't want to rent this place." Mm-hmm. And he said, "No, no, your visitors are your own thing." So he just said, "You know, that's not an issue." Mm-hmm. You know. So, but you have to ask cuz for some people it is. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've been in situations where people don't want you bring in a Dalit. And Jay Prakash is Dalit and he's a good guy and he has a key to this place he can come in any time. Cuz okay. I totally trust him. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't want anybody to say, "Oh, Jay can't do this or can't do that because he's Dalit." Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really offensive to me as well as Jay. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so even after education and you know smart city and everything the culture is still I read a wonderful book called Being Indian which helped me understand a lot and it's written by an Indian I forget the name but that book just explains so much <clears throat> and one of the things I always remembered is it said foreigners tend to look at trust as a switch you either trust people or you don't you trust them they do something mm-hmm. untrustworthy and you no longer trust them at all mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay and they said indians 
trust is a gliding switch. It can be okay. set at all different levels, you know. <laughs> and I, it helped explain that to me because I didn't understand, like my old rickshaw wall at Tara, how can you rip me off in the morning and not give me the change from the groceries and go out and buy a beer with it or something like that and cheat me? And then in the evening, come over and expect me to give you whiskey and have a party with me. It's like you ripped me off this morning. Okay. You know, <laughs> but I learned it's like, yeah, but that was just a little thing, cha-cha. You know, we're still friends. And it's like, oh, we are? You know? <laughs> but it helped me understand, you mm -hmm. know, the, the thinking. And I've actually become somewhat the same way now. Like, I'll, I'll trust people on different levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? I think this is a... We should wrap it up. Somehow. Wrap it up. It was an interesting session. And I think we'll, I'll be coming maybe again one more time. I don't know when, but uh, yeah, we can then. Uh, there are certain artworks that I would want you to like do a, a lot more explaining, you know, okay. about uh, the journey of the image and uh, things like that. But that we can do it on. I, a I don't think episode. you destroyed me. What what? I don't think you destroyed me, so you can't call this. Testing Gopal destroys Wazu X Wazu. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the times, let's say about Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, okay, he already has a lot of biographical books, and you know, a lot of people know him also. And me as a student uh, from MSU Baroda, I've also seen him coming all the time, you know, for exhibition and uh, talks. Reading from books is one thing, but then when you get to interact with that person, it's a totally different level. Yes. You know, uh, the way they explain the things, the way they choose their words, you know, and their emphasis on certain subjects. When you hear them talk, it's very different. That's what I'm trying to share with my listeners. Thank you. Thank Kassin. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> we'll do it again sometime. We'll do it again sometime. In the future. After hearing Vazvo's stories, it has been an inspiration for all of you to also work hard and believe in what you do. If you have any queries regarding the artist's work or about any art related subjects, you can get in touch with me through my social media pages or you can email me at um, tenzingopal at the rate gmail.com. And my dear friends, don't forget to follow my page, like and uh, share because I think it can spread love and happiness. You know and the uh, supporting artist is something that we all can do me as an artist also I under totally understand the challenges and struggles that we all have to go through in order to make our work um, accepted so many ways to convey a message or a thought or an idea and next time when you see Vasbo's work, I am 100% sure that you are going to have slightly different perspective about what he is trying to convey. Thank you very much for staying till the end. This is Mix Masala with DG, aka Fung Blue. Cheers.